so nice I started looking around for the lilies or something here. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get the paperwork out of here. I'm Tom Ivester, an alcoholic. <laughs> member of the primary purpose group of AA in, in, in uh, Southern Pines, North Carolina. I was kind of gently nudged into Alcoholics Anonymous uh, Groundhog Day of 57. I, I don't know if I've ever said this before, but it, uh, uh, let me say it anyway. My last drink was on the 19th of November of 56, but that was uh, no credit to me or AA either one. I got locked up that day. <laughs> <laughs> and I really haven't had a drink since, but uh, my first day of recovery was uh, the first meeting in, in February 2nd of 57. And I am deeply, deeply grateful for, uh, for that. <laughs> hey, that sounds like a long time, but I swear to God, it's gone by like a blur. And, and, uh, and I, hope to, I hope that your sobriety... As you get on into it, longer years, I hope it'll stay as as exciting and as enthusiasm producing as mine is. And if it does, you'll be a lucky person. I I am absolutely in love with AA today, and uh, about as active as I've ever been. I I think I've got more energy than I had when I was a pup. And uh, (laughs) one day it's going to run out, and I'll just boom, just go right down. the, uh, I want to welcome. Uh, by the way, I want to I want to thank folks on uh, working on the convention. That uh, absolutely great stuff. The greeters, the the readers, the meters, the eaters. <laughs> that, <laughs> they just done a, a just a fabulous job. <laughs> Even the committees that got in the closed rooms and fought, <laughs> all of it has just been really, really good. I also want to welcome uh, those who are, who, are, who are coming new into Alcoholics Anonymous. And I hope one day you'll be able to say what I say today, that the day I walked into this program was among the darkest days of my life. Little did I know that it was going to open the door to the brightest most invigorating, rewarding life a fellow could imagine, and, and so I welcome you to that. Also welcome a heck of a bunch of folk to the first convention, uh, to the first state convention. And uh, if, if you're anything like me on that, what this represented for me was getting started into a, a way of life in the convention area where my family grew. and. Uh, if you if you really could feel this story from the other side, I tell you this: when I walked into AA, I was the most isolated fellow I've ever seen, totally isolated. I didn't I wasn't close to one human on this earth, and today there are few places on this earth that I can go and not have good close friendships uh, anywhere. And what a wonderful feeling! And a lot of that came from just coming to things like this. And just just hanging out, mixing it up, and getting to know people. Larry's right. Uh, God, I hadn't seen Texans for, it's been two or three weeks, I guess, since I've seen a bunch of Texans. <laughs> and I'm about to go into a Texan withdrawal here. I, <laughs> glad I got here in time. And I shared a sentiment, too, about this great bunch of speakers. That, that's, and Patty O coming tomorrow. That's, uh, Patty's my sweetheart. She is a spiritual giant. She's in a small body, but she is a spiritual giant. This girl got more serenity. I've, I've watched her sit in spiritual bliss just watching a tree grow. <laughs> Very few people have developed that skill. And she'll make that sucker grow, too, I tell you what. <laughs> yeah, but she's my sweetheart, and I'm looking forward to the bar. So let me, let me tell you about raucous living and stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> I was thinking about that, that a lot of times we put the mouth on causation. You know, we kind of trivialize it like it's not important. And uh, I'm not one who does it. I think causation is, is, a, is quite important. I think you can live in it too long and get confused, but, but I think it's an important uh, uh, element of the, of the illness. As I want to visit just a little bit in causation before I start drinking, because that's what gets me ready. And uh, talk about some work, because I'm, I'm not naive enough to think that I bought my, uh, my alcoholism in a liquor store or a bar. You know, obviously, there's more to it than that. 
And so I was a guy, like, like every human being, I grew up in an environment populated with a bunch of folks. And, and it was filled with the kinds of experiences that everybody has, where some things go right and some things go wrong. Some things are pleasing, some things test you. Sometimes you develop strength and ability to deal with stuff. That's been a good well, uh, wellness kind of a cycle. Sometimes they don't go that way. Sometimes we take shots and get hurt. And rather than growing from it and getting past it, we'll tend to internalize it and let it get infested and start becoming a, a disturbing part of life. You know, we've got a name for those things. We call them defects of character. And uh, they are significant, truly significant, both in the development of the illness and in the program of recovery. And that's why I just wanted to visit for a minute. Let me just tell you that just a couple of things. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just isolate to a couple of things and then... Uh, and then we'll start cutting up with some booze and stuff. But <laughs> I was, uh, I don't like to admit this, uh, Sterling, no offense, baby, but I was born in South Carolina. I hope, I, <laughs> hope it doesn't offend Sterling. It offended the devil out of me. I, <laughs> I lived there until I got big enough to walk, and then I got out of there. And, and don't go back often unless it's to do a missionary trip in to try to heal some heathens or something. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't go there much. I got, I grew up on one of those little, didn't grow up, but I was born in, in early stuff, learned what cotton was, and I never wanted to see any more of it. But a little kid, and a, a typical kind of a hard scrabble family trying to scratch out a living in clay. I remember that stuff. I remember particularly getting introduced to fundamentalist Bible Belt religion. Now, that's a very, very active, very popular kind of thing for a lot of people. And for a lot of people, it works extremely well. I just happen to not be one of them. And so I was hauled into church early on when I was defenseless and little <laughs> and, uh, and introduced to some of that rock'em, sock'em stuff. Now, some people get into that and just groove with it, but not me. When I looked at that stuff, it was puzzling. Some of it was scary. A lot of it was just hard to tackle. And as a young kid, I came to believe that there wasn't much to it. And I'm talking about a preschool youngster, not a re rebellious teenager. I'm talking about a preschool youngster, where I recognized that there was just a good deal of that I didn't believe. And that is a tremendously troubling thing for most people and particularly for a kid that barely understands what he's disbelieving. But I had nagging d disbelief about that stuff. And what went with that was a lot of the associated stuff, guilt, confusion, shame, embarrassment, fear, tremendous things that, that resulted from that that were too bad to talk about, and I never talked about them until I got in AA. All I did was just sort of internalize those things, and that just progressed into a life where if I had any relationship with organized religion of any sort or any higher power, it was an antagonistic relationship. And so that was just one area of causation. The other that was uh, a little bit of, of significance in it, I, I may refer back to it a little later, I don't know, but it was... Uh, in, in the family deal, yeah, I, I was born into a fairly typical American family, two kids. Used to have an old sister seven years older than me, and somehow or other we've become identical twins now. We're the same age. I guess. <laughs> miracles of modern science, I guess. <laughs> well, we, we were scraping around down there, and one day I was sitting in the yard at the house, four years old, and my dad walked out of the yard. Didn't know where he was going, but somehow I just intuitively knew he wasn't coming back. That's a strange thing, but I could feel that since that. And he walked out, and I never saw him again in my life, except twice when I was a, a, a school, elementary school-age kid. Both times just very disappointing kinds of things. And so what happened at the conscious level, I just wrote that off. Any time during my formative years or, or even in the first few years of my recovery, if you'd asked me about that element of my life, I would have said there ain't none. There's nothing there because I just buried that. But I'll guarantee you, 
When a father walks out on a four-year-old son, that doesn't happen without damage. And so what I did was just bury that stuff. And, and so resolved it with the things that we called d d d defects of character, like insecurity, shame. You know, any time I get around people having a conversation about parents, I'd have to dummy up until I just kind of wrote it off. And so, see, those kinds of things, and that's just a couple. Uh, my mother remarried shortly after, so I had a replacement, but there wasn't much to him. He, he was from South Carolina. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you ever see people that you just flat don't like the minute you see them? I mean, it just, and mother brought this little old thing home, and uh, he, 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 he looked about like a fire hydrant. He's just a little old stubby little old short fellow that, his name was Alvin, and, and it just fit him somehow. And... I hated that sucker to the minute he, he drove up. Now, now, my sister was seven years older than me at the time, so, so she, called, she called the thing Alvin, and I had to call him Daddy. <laughs> God, I still get mad calling that thing Daddy. Every time I'd call him Daddy, that blood pressure would just go up. And he was a crumb bump. I mean, he was just a gross slug of a man. I, he just, he, you shake hands with him, you won't take a bath. You know, he was just a, he was a gross human being. And uh, no class at all. Used to pick me up by my ears sometime in a loving gesture. That's why they look like this. I got, I got, I got serious ears. Lyndon Johnson would envy me with those ears. He, hey, bad now. My head has grown to fit them somewhat. But these things have been this size all my life. Can, can you imagine a, a, a grammar school kid with something like this on his head? And, well, talking about causation. Now, that'll, that'll make you a little flinchy when, when you're like that. And, and so, but anyway, that, that, was, that, was, that was Alvin. And, and, uh, I promised myself if I ever got big enough, I was going to beat that sucker like a drum. And I, and I meant to do it. I, I really meant to do it. But I went off to the Army, and they fed me pretty good. And when I came back, I was too big. I mean, you, you can't whoop a midget. I, I, got, <laughs> I mean, David used to try to whoop some of them, but David wasn't right. <laughs> And so I never able to get to whoop the old fool. He died and uh, was slow about it. But <laughs> and the uh, only good thing I can say about that is they buried him in South Carolina. <laughs> Every once in a while I'll go down Highway 85, that's our, our, our interstate, and I'll just sort of go over there to that cemetery and make sure he hadn't clawed out or something. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, that kind of sets you up, eh? Yeah, when you get that. Somebody said one time that we, we're not different than other people. We're just like anybody else, only more so. <laughs> and I think that really describes it. And so with that kind of stuff and just a whole bunch of other stuff, I was ready, man, when, when, it, when booze came along. I was like the old man. When that stuff came along, it did something for me. I mean, it took an awkward, gangly, skinny, big-eared kid with a doofus personality. And, uh, man, that thing gave me savoir faire. And I, <laughs> I don't know what that is, but it just describes, <laughs> it sounds like what I felt. You know? And so I just off and running. I'd, I wasn't somebody who had a drinking problem. Shoot, I had a drinking solution. And uh, I, I would have been stupid to not drink. Good God, that's the best medicine I ever had, the most reliable medicine I ever had in my life. Best friend I ever had in my life from a reliability standpoint was booze. Somebody said earlier today, quit working for him. Never quit working for me. It just worked overtime and, and, <laughs> and wore me out. You know. <laughs> so what I found was a major league solution. I, I would have been an idiot to not.
And so I just took to it. I fell in love with the, with the booze in life, loved everything about it, loved the people that did it, loved all the trashy behavior that went with it, <laughs> loved waking up in strange places with most strange, well, <clears throat> I don't ever tell this, but I, I, I better not. <laughs> I'll just say that she lived in the far north, and I woke up with her, and she would dress out at about 300 pounds, I think. <laughs> I didn't know her. I got... Anyway, I mean, sometimes there's a downside to frivolity, and that was one of them. <laughs> so, so, so I was just, I was just rolling. And, uh, and I just crashed through life like that. I, I was just so caught up in that kind of crazy behavior that I never did really achieve much in life. I never did lose much and never had much. Never held a job for as much as a year until I got sober, except the Army. And I tried to quit that one, but they kept locking me up, come get me, lock me up every time I'd quit. And so, so finally quit kick, quit, quit, quit quitting. And they fired me. They gave me a same kind of old man. I got an undesirable discharge for alcoholism. Back then, they didn't have programs for folks like they do now. And so I just was sort of crashing through life. I was the kind of guy that looked either impossibly good or ridiculously bad. I was the kind of guy that if I got sober for any period of time, and I'm talking a few days, I'd snap back. Man, I'd look good. You know, most people don't think I'm 88 years old now. <laughs> God, I hope they don't. <laughs> but I, I always snapped back good, you know, and, and so I had an ability. I don't know if it was just that malicious, manipulative nature of, of guys like me, but I had a, a, an amazing propensity for getting overrated. God knows people just thought I was a world beater. I've been overrated all my life. I still am. I mean, people think I know stuff. I don't know stuff. I just make it up, you know. I just, <laughs> Yeah, whatever makes sense at the time, you know, and often it's on target, you know, if I don't think about it too long. If I think about it, I'll screw it up. And so I, I had that kind of ability that I was either looking like a world beater or looking like the world fell on me, and, and so I just sort of crashed through. And in the middle of all that, I developed alcoholism. Now, I was extremely busy living that kind of life, so I didn't notice it when we, cro when we crossed that line from that wild, crazy, celebrational drinking, or whatever you call it, into alcoholism. I, I, didn't, I didn't notice anything about it. That's a fairly subtle process, I guess, because I didn't notice it at all. I, I was probably passed out at the time. And, uh, but, but something happened that I don't fully understand, don't care to understand. I just want to make sure that I never doubt it for one second. I crossed a line from that kind of wild, weird-looking behavior just, just wild, crazy party drinking. I crossed a line into a to a to a region I was to never leave. I developed alcoholism, and I don't understand that. I don't pretend to understand that. Don't care to understand that. What I know is that if my life changed in the sense that's described very well in our book with a very polite sounding little sentence that I think is the best definition of alcoholism I've ever heard that we are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. And I love that definition. I think that's a very clear definition. Some people say the book doesn't define it. It describes, defines it for me. Because, and I like that because it has no histrionics associated with it. It has nothing to do with how much I drank, how long I drank, what I drank, what I did when I drank. Has nothing to do with how many times I got my nose broke, went to jail, got married. Got married one time, for God's sakes, to a woman I didn't even know. Now, I tell you, that'll, that'll put a scrimp in your style and put a dent in your wallet, too, when you start paying out of it. But that doesn't define alcoholism. It, just, it defines some bad drinking, I, I'll tell you that. But it doesn't define alcoholism. You know, what defines it, and it's not whether I'm smart, dumb, gay, straight, rich, poor, educated, dumb. There's nothing to do with any of that. It has something to do with something that happens on the inside where I lose the ability to control. If I take a drink, I can't predict what I'll do, how much I'll drink, what I'll drink, where I'll go, and what I'll do. It, it just is an absolute mystery, and I, I don't understand that. Doesn't, I really don't care to either. I, I, you know, one thing about it, this illness 
something that doesn't yield to education. It doesn't yield to knowledge. I've sponsored people who were so brilliant about the big book that they could even talk about it when they were drunk better than I could sober. <laughs> <You've got it. laughs> won't do it. It just won't do it. You know, it has to do with something more fundamentally sounded than just, just, just ideas and notions. And so that's what happened. I, and I just kind of crashed into all of that. Now that, from that point on, my life, it never had been very reliable or predictable, but from that point on, it was Katie bar the door. And, and, and I didn't, I really didn't notice what was happening because it, it is a subtle process. And, and, but my life changed well, I went from a young fellow that bounced out of a school in Belmont, in, just, uh, just west of Charlotte, in North Carolina, at 16, and then eight years later, was living up in the city of Flint, Michigan. I don't know why I went there. I mean, it's just where scaggy people went, I guess. And, and so I <laughs> just was a natural thing, like why geese fly to Alabama or somewhere. <laughs> I've got. So anyway, I, I wound up in, uh, in beautiful downtown Flint, made Buicks for a while. <laughs> well, well, I worked in a Buick plant for a while. <laughs> if, uh, if anybody bought a 53 or 54 Buick, I'll talk to you about the ninth step. I, <laughs> I guess. And, and that, in that town, I, I, uh, I worked. Uh, I worked on regular work till I, till my reputation got in front of me, and I wound up in a city of half a million people, unemployed, darn near unemployable. In the last couple of years that I drank, you know, I used to sort of euphemistically say that I live by my wits, but that's not exactly true. Uh, I live by my lack of character. I know of precious little that a man can do that I haven't done. Uh, you can you, you can believe that's no reverse macho statement that you know, I'm some street hoodlum gangster. I, I was a hopeless, helpless alcoholic, and, and I lived by scavenging off people. I, I made a specialty out of. Uh, I was kind of cute back then. I mean, <laughs> even hung over. Uh, so I, I sort of made a specialty out of finding tender-hearted ladies. They wanted to take in a quote border, and uh, the downside to that too, I, I tell you, they uh, sometimes you draw one that you wish you hadn't. I, I had one lady that uh, she was really a nice girl, well she, but she was weird. She, she, <laughs> she learned of, of a guy that could heal people like me. Now I mean, even drunk, I knew better than this, but. This guy's name was Reverend Cadillac Jack. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. How many bridges you want to buy? But, but she got into that, uh, Reverend Cadillac Jack. Well, she was buying the stuff. And so I said, well, we'll go see Cadillac Jack. <laughs> well, I hate to even admit it now. It embarrasses me even to drunk to, to be doing something like that. That dumb. So I went in and he laid the words on me and uh, read some stuff. And then he gave a prescription, I guess the kind of reverend gives, to him anyway. His pres prescription was that she was supposed to wrestle me into the bathtub every day. God. And supposed to put, I don't never understand this, put blueing in the water. <laughs> blueing, you got to be old. Larry knows what it is. You got to <laughs> <laughs> blue and you put something blue in there that makes stuff turn white. And I, I don't understand. I tell you, it doesn't make an alcoholic turn white. Man, I come out here looking like a cold smelt or something. I, well, God, it's amazing what a drunk has to put up with in, in, in this world. And so anyway, that was just just one of it. I, and I, where I lived was uh, it was not it was not Disneyland by any stretch of imagination. I, I lived in a in a I never would have imagined I'd wind up like that. That was a grungy piece of town. And, and in that, I mean, what I did, I mean, I imagined there's some statute that would say it was illegal, but it's not illegal in that jungle. I mean, it's in that jungle you either you either rob or get robbed. I mean, it, it's not crime; that's the food chain. That's just the way it works. You either the rollie or the roller, because somebody's gonna get rolled. I, I guarantee you that. And uh, so, anyway, that's where I wound up. Then, then. then.
they had just just about gave up the ghost. Uh, I'm not proud of any of that stuff, not not whatsoever. Sold my blood five bucks a throw. I'm not proud of that. I'd have let them suck me dry if they hadn't had controls on that kind of stuff. And so I was gone, is the point, you know, and I'm, and I'm in my early 20s, and I'm at a point where my life's done. You know, alcoholism is not about the external trouble. It's about dying on the inside, and that's what's happening. I'm, I'm dying, <laughs> dying on the inside. And as a guy in his early 20s, I, I got to the point I couldn't even stand to look at myself in a mirror. I didn't want to throw up. The most dominant thought in my mind was, why don't you just end it all? You know, that's just real, real, real social drinking. And, and, uh, and so I just ran that string out. And, and uh, you know, it would be nice if, if I could tell you that, that I finally had enough call for help. Somebody threw me a rope, but that's just not so. And, and most, of, most of you folks are well aware that I wound up doing the thing that I, I'm confident that, that there isn't a person in this room who hasn't had great fears about doing the kind of thing, whether we're alcoholic or not. You, probably the, the people around the alcoholic just it's like, no, you, you worry about where your person's gone, you know, and, and, and know that, that uh, good God, anything could happen. I knew I was capable of anything, but I never believed that those, those fears would be realized. I was the kind of guy to wake up in the morning panicky no matter where I was, would go out if I had a car to look, see if there was blood on it or anything like that, and always just breathe a sigh of relief and go do it again. But one morning it was not to be that way. I woke up in jail in, in Flint, no novelty there. That was a common occurrence. I, I, was in, I, was, I knew everybody there, Most of, everybody locked up and the people worked there. <laughs> it was a regular place. And so when I, when I came to, I assumed I was in there for the same as always, drunk, hustling, scuffling on the street, fighting, rolling somebody, whatever. But always just petty stuff. And I assumed it was more of the same. And, and when I was awake a little while, jailer came by, and I, I knew him. I said, uh, when can I get out? And, and, and he would normally say 10 o'clock, but that day he said, I hope never, and walked on. And I, I didn't, I had no clue what he was talking about. But I knew he wasn't, he wasn't kidding. I, I mean, it was serious as a heart attack. And as he walked away, and then I went back into the tank, and, and some of the other guys in, I guess, had read the newspaper or something. And the night before, the, the, the bad dreams that many alcoholics had had become a real nightmare for me. And I was greeted with the fact that the night before, blind, drunk, blacked out, driving a car down the main street of that city. I don't even know whose car. They're driving it down the main street of the city and ran down and killed two people whose only mistake was trying to cross the street I was driving on. And, and you know, the, the amazing thing is that that hadn't happened earlier. You know, I, I think when a guy like me gets on the street driving a car, it's like firing a high-powered rifle down the street and hope it doesn't hit somebody. And so that <laughs> was shock, disbelief. I, it was not so much that I couldn't believe it, it's just that I couldn't handle it. You know, the mind will protect itself. Eh? It won't take in what it can't handle. And, and so my response was just to push it away and, and just refuse to, to accept the fact. It gradually did. Only time I'd ever been in jail didn't try to get out. Nobody knew I was in there. I had family in North Carolina, but I didn't call anybody. I didn't want out. I wanted to disappear. I, I, I didn't want. I was ashamed to be breathing when the two fine young folks no longer were because of me. And so I, I had absolutely nothing. I, I didn't try to scheme. The, the scheming was done. I didn't try to scheme or figure out how to get out or what kind of defense. I had no defense. I couldn't even, I didn't even know what I'd done other than what they told me. And, uh, and just so somebody, uh, one of the policemen, for some reason, best I can tell, took it on himself. And I never have really tried to, to, tra to track him down because I, I, I suspect he wanted privacy. And, and so he, he didn't announce who he was. But he, a policeman there called my folks. They learned they were down in North Carolina and told them that they had a guy up there in a lot of trouble. If they wanted to do anything, they better come on up. And so they did. You know how families will tend to be. And um, they came up. I didn't know how to tell them I, I didn't want to get out of there. I, I was afraid to get out of there. I was ashamed to get out of there. I didn't know how to say that. So they got an attorney and got to be released on bond. I, and, and on the 17th of July of, of 56, I was released from jail. Now, I, didn't, I, I did not consider alcoholism at any serious level, even though I'd been thrown out of the military for it and I'd been diagnosed with it by everybody who ever captured me, but I had never seriously considered it. What I did consider was that having done something as horrible as I had done, I couldn't take a drink.
I just wrote it off that that's something I could not do. The guilt was too great. And I walked out, didn't know what to do. I mean, I'm just sort of at, at, at odds. I can't sit down. I can't stand to be around people. I walk the streets all night. And about noon the next day, on July 18th, I was as drunk as a man could be. And did my level best to stay that way till July 9th, or November 19th, the, the date of my last drink. I hope and pray my last drink has been so far. And that day I finished a bottle of gin, went down to the, to the court, and, and I really was not interested in a trial. I just went to do whatever I had to do and to take the punishment. And uh, the uh, lawyer told me to enter a plea of stand mute, which means I got nothing to say. You know, what else could I say? You know, I can't even describe my own crime if somebody has to tell it to me. And so we went through the... Uh, the procedures, and I was found guilty, of course. I, did, I didn't have any doubt about that. And sentenced to a max of 15 years in the Michigan State Penitentiary. And, uh, and I was not a neophyte. I, I was a neophyte about going to a penitentiary. I, all of my troubles had been fairly minor and fairly local with you know, overnights and county jails and stockades in the military and pea farms, all that kind of stuff. It was always kind of lightweight stuff. And it, but I understood when he passed that sentence what that meant. I knew it was coming. I was, I was prepared as you can get. But when he passed that sentence, I, I had an instinctive, very human reaction of fear. But at the same time, the most real sense of relief I'd ever known because I knew it was over. It was over. And I'm not talking about hope or there'll be help there. Nothing like that. It's just done. It's done. And the next day, I <clears throat> walked in that place chained with some other guys with the absolute conviction that I would never come out of there alive. And, and I truly did not care. There's a, there's a point you get that the fight is over, and you just give up and just roll with whatever comes. And that's, that's what it was. I went in there, and they stuck me in a cell. I didn't communicate with anybody. I, I wasn't particularly antisocial. I was asocial. I, I just didn't, I didn't re connect anybody, didn't converse with anybody. I never knew who was in the next cell or pay any attention to it. I spent my time sitting at the cell, staring at my navel, doing anything I could do to keep from thinking. And one day, I wasn't looking for anything. And I'll tell you this, and I, it's like our CPCPI folk, and you know, I wish we had stronger CPC and PI around the country because I think I'm pointing to Valerie because we've got a desk in New York on CPC and PI, and it's a vital thing. And, and if, if it hadn't been for something that looked very much like CPC work, I guarantee you I wouldn't be here today. If I had had, if my coming into Alcoholics Anonymous had required any initiative whatsoever on my part to make it happen, I would have never come. If I'd have had to ask for help, you know, we're real, we're real, we're real commonly, very often say, well, if they want it, they'll come get it. Or when they've had enough, you know, they'll come. Well, you can thump that up. If you take that posture with it, I'll guarantee you, you'll go to a lot more funerals than anniversaries because it just is contrary to the illness. And certainly to me, I mean, I was just, I, I could not have asked anybody for a glass of water, much less to get involved in my life. And, and so what happened that, that makes me feel that kind of passion for, for, for a, a CPC type work? A guy called me out for an interview, and I've been interviewed by lots of folks. Uh, all my life, and, and uh, this guy called me out, did the same old familiar family history type of thing in social history, and he got through with it, made the same old familiar diagnosis, and I, the only diagnosis I've ever had is, my God, you drink a lot, you're a drunk, you're a problem drinker, you're an alcoholic. Heard that all my life and never meant a thing. Every time somebody would diagnose me that way, they would follow it with a wonderful recommendation, like, why don't you quit drinking? And, uh, <laughs> That never made sense to me. I, it never made sense. Booze is the only friend I've got. I'm going to give that up. You know, I, I, it just never did. I, I don't know if I was the village idiot or what, but I, I'd never, till I was sober and I connected the first drink with where I wound up. I thought I wound up in those bizarre situations because I was just a worthless scumbag. I, I never thought that something happened to me when I took a drink didn't happen to other people. And so this guy got through with his deal, and he said, man, you've had a lot of trouble with booze. And I said, yeah. <laughs> you know, Pope would have a lot of trouble if he drank as much as I did. Anybody
That was just natural. And uh, he said something I'd never heard. He said, we have an AA group here at the institution, and I think you ought to go. And that was just a conversational thing. It wasn't one of these capturing deals where they put a leash on you and, and monitor you forever. It was none of that. It just was a flat kind of a statement, just an objective kind of statement. You, know, you, you, you got a place over here, you ought to go over there. And then he sent me a note, just a little, looked like a telegram, a little old piece of paper about like that. It said you can go to your, you had to be on a list to go because if there are 300 members of the group, they just didn't have room. And, and so he sent me a note and said, you're, you're cleared to go. You can start on February 2nd of 57. I, I didn't particularly want to, go, want to go. I didn't particularly not want to go. I, I just was sort of, I was almost neuter about the, about the thing. I, I was past feeling. I, I guarantee you the last thing I wanted to do was mix up with a lot of frivolous people. I, I guarantee you that. I didn't want to get into a whole bunch of smoking, joking, and handshaking and stuff. Isolation is a peculiar thing, and that's no, 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 no brand new information for, for many of you, I know. But, it, it, but isolation is a peculiar thing in that some of the things that are offered are not welcome to an isolated person. They're threatening, like shaking hands or hugging. Or you know, I still get flinchy about holding hands in the Lord's Prayer after all these years. You imagine, well, well we didn't hold hands in that joint. If you uh, if you held hands in there, they, it's well. Anyway, it uh, so. I, but I, I mean, I just didn't want to. I, and if I, if it had required an issue, I couldn't have done it. And and so I I uh, I, I, I went to, went to that meeting just just shuffled in, and uh, it just I had no fight. You know, and, and I tell you, I, I never realized what that phase of my life, how valuable it was. Because there is nothing, nothing, nothing that comes close to the value of surrender. I honestly believe that every successful long-term recovery grows out of surrender. It's not an academic exercise. It's not a will thing. It's not an achievement thing. It's a surrender thing. And until I surrender, nothing happens. And, and so fortunately, I, was, I wasn't in bottom because I was in the penitentiary. I was in bottom because the, 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 my life had just culminated and I could, I could see who I was. And so, you know, I, I, the tightest prison I was ever in, in in my life was the one I lived in before I got in AA. I'd been in prison all my life. That other thing was just a cage. But the prison of a life that locks you down is a different thing. And so I wasn't thrilled about going. I walked in, huge, huge meeting. And uh, one guy spoke to me. I had an officer on the door. He read my name, Ivester, and I said, yeah. And he said, sit down. And I sat down and listened to my first meeting. And, and, and thank God that I didn't fall in love with it. I, I hear people, and I marvel at them, who walk in and they just say, home at last. Yeah. God, I felt like I was on the wrong planet. It, it, I, I didn't identify. Now, granted, I was fairly young at that point. I was 24, and 24-year-old and People were not showing up in Alcoholics Anonymous, <laughs> not anywhere that I ever went. And uh, I was the youngest member at every, every meeting I attended for years, the youngest member in the entire state of North Carolina. I got so tired of people patting me on the head, <laughs> <laughs> telling me how lucky I was. I said, yeah, man, I'm on a real roll. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a weird place to be when you're the youngest cat around. Most of them had drunk more years than I was years old. And, and so I, I had a real, real problem sitting sit, sit in there. Everything, everything about it looked churchy to me. And I had, I had that deep-seated thing I mentioned in the beginning, that that was not casual feelings. That was a deep inability to, to accommodate that kind of thing. And so when I walked in, I, I, in the back of my mind, I said, this is going to be a tent meeting revival. Sure as the world. And sure enough, the first thing we did was pray. Pray. Same prayer we did here. We haven't got a new prayer in all these years. <laughs> and the minute I heard that prayer, I said, see there? I, I knew it. Yeah, and uh, then they read the stuff. Yeah, well, didn't read good stuff like Bill read. He read that. Sound like poetry, I mean, it's stuff we read, or, or scriptures or stuff. Yeah, and I, I didn't know that was a program. And and, and then the 
speaker. And uh, I really enjoyed the delegates panel today that you were on with about the, the delegates panel. It, it, was, it was really good. Uh, the first guy that spoke, my, the man that spoke at my first meeting was the delegate for the state of Michigan uh, uh, that, when I heard him speak. I thought he was an escapee from a nut house or something. I, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make you crazy to be a delegate. You don't even have to be crazy to be a delegate. You help sometimes. But, but this guy told his story. Well, I'd never heard an alcoholic tell. I'd heard him tell stories, but not their own. And <laughs> that, that, that had to be true. Nobody's going to make that up. But I, I sat there listening to that man, and I'm thinking, what on earth is wrong with him? Undressing in front of 300 hair legged convicts made no sense to me. And uh, when I left there, I was more bewildered, but I was probably, I didn't wrestle with it, but I was probably even more bewildered the next week when I found myself sitting back there. And no, you know, nobody sent for me. I didn't have to go. They wouldn't have even known if I wasn't there or cared. I was just another lost, tragic face in a sea of lost, tragic faces. But I found myself back. And what drew me back, I, I later came to understand, was that magnetic enthusiasm that imbued that man's life. He was the most enthusiastic person I've ever seen. Thank God for that. Thank God for enthusiastic people. Sad sacks don't turn me on. And that guy was absolutely alive. He looked like a guy that was in recovery and liked it. And, and, uh, and that's what brought me in. I, did, I, I would not come back for any other reason. I was fortunate in that I went into an excellent AA group. And I'm talking about a group that understood the fifth tradition and carried it out as well as any group I've ever seen. Thank God for that. It was a group where they took the new guys that came in and would sort of channel them off into a small group and go through the steps, not working the steps like we do now, but just introducing to the steps. And that was valuable for me. First place I ever heard the term design for living. And boy, that made a lot more sense than heavenly magic show. A whole lot more to a guy like me. And I was introduced in a loving kind of way, not by rocket scientists or people from New York or a state delegate, by other guys in the joint just like me. The only difference was that they were ahead of me and they'd learned something and they turned around and shared it. I became one of those guys who was one of the leaders and not too long afterward that. And so I, I value that. I value that so very much because it, it put logic in the picture that this is not some mysterious thing that descends on you that the program of AA is a design for living. It's a, it's a process where if we take the actions, we'll change. And what those guys told me and I found to be true was if there's 200 words in the steps, if you take the actions laid out in those steps, when you get through, you'll be a different captain. You'll be the same old guy, still be tall and ugly, but you will be a different cat. You'll have a different mind. And, and, they, and they said, and I found it to be true, that motives don't even matter. Because if you take those actions to the best of your ability, your motives will change. And so I, <laughs> I, I take that literally. It's been many, many, many years since I've even thought about anybody's motives. I couldn't care less. Tell you what makes me nervous is somebody comes in here pure. That's <laughs> just because they want to join alcohol. I, I am always suspicious of that. <laughs> that Anyway, I, I got going, and that was a great group. They introduced me to, uh, I, they, nobody ever made any formal deal like you want to get in service. It was just a natural thing. That group was an active group. They did service, and I just sort of got in with them. Tell you one thing that helped me enormously, and it's good for isolated people. It's kind of like Sterling was saying that, that when, when a new person comes in, I don't hand them a book the first thing, and particularly somebody who's sort of standoffish and scared. You know, what I'll hand them is a broom or the other end of a table <laughs> or whatever because physical activity is all some people can accommodate. I'm one of the finest chair setter uppers I've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, I'm good at it, man. I, I've been doing it for 48 years. For God's sakes, if I'm not good at it, I ought to quit. Because, <laughs> but that was important to me because it gave me the sense of belonging, the sense of belonging. It's just like we were going to move this table. Now, there's three great, big, handsome, strong men up here. Well, one anyway. <laughs> that, if we were going to move that, any one of us could do it. But think how much more fun and meaning it would have if the three of us sort of figured out how to work that on a, as a team. See what I'm talking about? Yeah, that's the kind of thing.
through is the physical involvement that sort of makes you feel like you're on the team. The spirit goes up, morale comes back, and you get ready to take on some stuff. And, and so I, I, was, I was fortunate to be introduced in, a, in an excellent group of AA. And, and I had uh, so much for the 930 dance. It's, uh, it's it, well, we, we're all right so far. I, I, I'm going to get you out of jail and get you rich and famous, and then, uh, then we'll go dance. <laughs> I, I'm, uh, I, I just sort of distill it down to this. I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I, fellowship is an important thing, and, and so far that's what I've described is the fellowship, you know, where the groups come together, we do some stuff together, we have action and stuff. But I, I believe it's just like that there's causation in alcoholism, there's also causation in recovery. And, and it's the work in the program that produces the results. And so I'd, I'd relish the, the, the things that came to me by just participating with the guys and getting my spirit right. It was vital. God, it was vital. But it's also about being free. And, and those things that drove my drinking also drove my misery in recovery. Because defects of characters don't dry up because you don't drink. As a matter of fact, they tend to grow. And miserable is what dry produced for me. And so I was fortunate in that I kind of stumbled in. Back then we didn't have organized working of the steps much, but I kind of stumbled in with people who were really getting serious about this thing, and I started doing the steps. And I, I, just, I just draw it down to this. I think there are three basic sets of action that occur. It's really oversimplifying, but you know, it, one's the first three steps. And, and the first three steps essentially have about surrender, that valuable commodity called surrender. I'm beat. And the other part of it is that it's about finding a power. And it doesn't matter what that power is as long as it makes enough sense to you that you think it can save your life. That's all. Thank God for that freedom. Thank God for that freedom for a guy like me. And, and that's what that is. That was a very important thing. But it really doesn't register recovery so much. It's more about survival, about getting a foundation from which recovery can grow. Now, there's no pass-fail in a, well, there is a pass-fail, but you'll usually get graded at the bar if you fail. And uh, the thing about the program, there's no absolute right way to do it. I have a way that I believe, you know, and, and, and I believe that the, the steps are the heart and soul of it. The, the thing about this is that you, you, you can quit whenever you're willing to accept what you got. I know people who have never done the steps, never claimed to. I knew one guy whose claim to fame was that he never read the big book. He'd tell anybody. He loved to tell newcomers, y'all never have read this book. He, he, he looked like he had never read the book. <laughs> but he's free to do that, you know. So there's no absolutes you got to do. So if you're satisfied to just survive on a day-to-day -day basis, the first three steps will do it, and I've seen it happen. But my case is too aggravated for that. I'm somebody who is driven by the compulsion, driven by the defects, driven by the things that make me miserable and make me walk funny in life. And so the next two steps are basically about getting down to the causes and conditions with that inventory process where I take a look and see what is it that drives this ship in such a funny kind of pattern and then start to understand about the hopeless condition called alcoholism I'm not somebody who wised up and decided not to drink. I'm somebody who can't drink. And God, what peace there is with that statement. My inventory caused that to happen, and that's where I really settled in and accepted at the core of my being, I'm alcoholic, period. And I've never had one second's question about that for 48 years, not one second. I surrendered. The other thing that happened there was to recognize that there were lots of things that were out of whack in my life. They didn't all come in one fell swoop, but I started to recognize about those defects of character, that there were things that not drinking wouldn't cure, that I'm going to be miserable. My, my choice is whether I'm going to be having some peace in this thing and being made free. And six and seven are just uh, they're, they're simple steps. All they call for is one of the most Tre tremendously important decisions of my life because by now I've accepted the fact I've got trouble, I've surrendered, I've taken a look at the, at the causes and conditions, I understand what I say and when I say I'm an alcoholic, the question now is you want to get well or don't you? You want to make the changes or don't you?
Do you want to recover or do you want to just hang out? Uh, I'll tell you this, and it borders on an editorial comment. I won't dwell on it. I'll just say it enough to maybe get you to think about it. I, I think it's an important juncture in 6 and 7 where people either move into recovery or move into some sort of a hold pattern or a maintenance pattern where it will drift in quite often, and I've seen it, God knows, unfortunately, all too often, where people decide not to move forward into doing the steps that, that really set forth the freedom and will move into kind of a fix where they see meetings as the solution. Where if I go to meetings, I get my help, and I go, and then I go on about my business. And, and what is bred in the program is a sort of culture where folks kind of flit around like hummingbees and just sort of go suck a little sap here and then a little sap there. And, and that's fine if you want to get by on lightweight maintenance. I call that pit stop AA. And that's about what it looks like to me. And it's fine if somebody wants to do it. I don't. You know, mine is a different kind of a case. And I want to be free. I want to breathe free. I want to be able to, to take my place in this world. I had the great privilege of, of sitting in Toronto at, the, at my first international convention and sitting in a small meeting with, uh, you said, clear room with traditions. <laughs> we, we, I, I saw Bill a lot of times. That was the primary reason I went there. But he was always in huge crowds. And we had a tradition meeting. There was only about 30 of us in there. So I had a chance to have a real intimate, up close, and personal meeting. I didn't say, I didn't want to say anything to him. I just wanted to make sure he was there. You know, it's, uh, so I'm there listening. And I heard him describe about the process of freedom that comes with this part of the steps. Uh, he was talking about, he was, he was really was talking about anonymity and tradition, but he was talking about the freedom that comes when we take the actions that are laid out in the amends process. My belief is this. He helped form it. But my belief is that every time I screwed over, misused, abused, hurt, humiliated, embarrassed somebody else, I didn't win. I lost. And I paid for it with a piece of my soul. And my honest belief is that I will never be a free man until I go back and make right those things. And I'm talking about drawing it out, you know, I've had people that I almost had to hold them to, to make them let me do amends. Because most of the people, other, I mean, some notable exceptions, but most people I try to make amends to would want to just say, oh, no, 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 you're okay. You were always a good fellow. You weren't that bad baloney. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody else's, I, I guess, benevolent manner and kindness does not translate to amends. That just tells me I've got some nice friends. But it's got nothing to do with clearing my soul of the garbage I carry. And so the amends process is about my side of the street, about getting rid of those things. I have literally had to hold people by the lapels and say, listen to me, listen to me. And, uh, but it was important for me to do that. And, uh, and so that's, that's where the freedom starts to come. I heard Bill say in that meeting in Toronto that he said, if you do these actions, there will come a day when you'll be able to walk the face of this earth and look any human you see in the eye. And I was about up to knees. <laughs> and I thought, surely you jest, big boy. But the man told the truth. Today, I have the great privilege of traveling a lot, a lot of places. I don't know of one human on this planet that I can't comfortably face and look in the eye. Call it what you wish. That's freedom. That's freedom. I heard a guy say it at one of our Rock Creek deals over there one time, something that really vividly portrayed what Bill was talking about. He said, there'll come a time when you'll be able to say to anybody, ask me anything you wish. My life is an open book. That's freedom. And that's what comes from the amends process. It's not about the Better Business Bureau. It's about amends. And then the rest of the steps are about putting the principles to work, and then good stuff happens. I was, uh, I finally got out of prison. That doesn't, it doesn't take a genius to get out. It just takes time. And I, so I finally, I actually got out remarkably quick. I, I only stayed three and a half years. And, uh, and, uh, and I was released on my first eligibility and, and, and on condition I go to North Carolina and uh, not South Carolina, but North Carolina. <laughs>
uncom uncomfortably close to the line. And, uh, and it was great to go. And I, 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 was, I had my contacts made. I had a contact a year before I was even eligible for consideration. I, I, I knew I wanted to go. I knew AA was my lifeline. And when I walked out of that place, I had a steely commitment that I will never go through that again. And I knew that AA was my lifeline, pure and simple. As I hit the ground, and uh, it was great to be, uh, it was great to be free, of course. And uh, started to work, got immediately active in AA day one. Got me, uh, went to a prison the second week I was out. I didn't know they'd let me, I, didn't, I knew they might put me in one, but I, I didn't know they'd let me just go in one as a trusted servant. Jeez, I just got out of a maximum custody joint. And uh, two months after I was out, I was named outside sponsor of the AA group in a prison. What a tremendous affirmation. Could have been more affirmed if I'd been elected governor. And a tremendous honor. I'm an outside sponsor of a prison today. I always had that yearning deal to get through my career and, and go back as an outside sponsor. And I do that today. The old man and I work together in the prison. And uh, so I just, 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 just hit the ground and, and jumped right in. Uh, two months after I was out, the pro supervisor saw who, who he was dealing with, I guess, and uh, he said, Tom, you're real active in this AA thing. Wouldn't it help you if you could drive? And when I'd left Michigan for obvious reasons, that this man on my papers, this man's never drive a motor vehicle, and I accepted that as a fact. Two months after, he said, wouldn't it help you if you could drive? And I said, yes, sir, but I can't, like he didn't know. And uh, he said, well, let me check it out. And one day he called me not very long afterward and said, come up to the Sears stores where the license agency was. The story is absolutely true. Walked in, sister drove me up there. She's now a twin. And so she <laughs> drove me up and, uh, and I walked in and my guy introduced me to the fellow and they chatted for a while. When they got through chatting, the man I didn't know handed me a driver's license. Handed it to me. He didn't even ask me if I could drive. I took no test of any kind, road, written, verbal, nothing. Didn't even pay for it. <laughs> Four dollars at the time. I couldn't afford it, I don't think. <laughs> Some people said I must have been well connected politically. You bet. You bet. <laughs> what I truly believe is that when God's got work for us to do, the walls come down. And I don't care what they are. I know it on my own history. I know it on God knows the hundreds of people that have made impossible comebacks look so simple. When God's got work for us to do. The walls come down. Five months after that, I was DCM. And, and the same guy who wondered if he would ever be trusted by anybody. And I'm asked to be the trusted servant for 15 cities in my state. Two years after his out, I got a phone call from the state capitol and a man on the phone I'd met once. He visited the AA group that I sponsored. And uh, I didn't know him. We chatted two or three minutes. And he, he said, Mr. Ivester, we're expanding a rehabilitation program in our prison system, and we were wondering if you would consider accepting a position. And the first thing I just instinctively said was, do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> and uh, he said, oh, yeah, we've checked you out. Well, I'll tell you what makes that still almost unbelievable to me. As of that day he called, there had never been an ex-con in history hired into a prison system. And I didn't believe they were going to start with me. But if they're going to do it, they got to start with somebody. And, uh, it, and so they did. I was employed as a rehabilitation officer in the, in the North Carolina prison system and, and put in a 39-year career that uh, I wouldn't have traded with Bill Gates. I, I had a marvelous, marvelous, exciting, challenging, rewarding career. Went to the top of my profession as, as far as I wanted to go. Became a head of prisons. I was, uh, I, I was, uh, I, I never even counted up. It was six or eight prisons that I, that I headed. I became the go-to guy for developing new stuff. I've always been a kind of a wild, creative type of a fellow. And uh, if you want somebody to manage something in a quiet way, don't get me. I guarantee you, I'll have a revolution going on the next day. Because I, I'm just not a status quo guy. And, and, and so they, the, the man knew that when he asked me to do it. And so I, I went at it. And, and so I, I finished that career. And then when I left the system, and I'm going to quit right along, right along here. I had to work up to it, but I'm going I'm to quit. The... Uh,
When I left that system, I, I mean, you know, I've had a high-pressure career for 39 years, and, and uh, I wasn't particularly tired. I, I'm one who finds that vigorous activity doesn't tire me. It, it, it exhilarates me. It, it pumps me up. And, and, and so when I re retired, I, I wasn't particularly wanting to go to the funny farm. I just wanted to get out of, this, get out of there, and, and uh, I made a vow that I would never do anything else for hire that, uh, of, any of any sort. That for the rest of my life, it's going to be for free and for fun. And I got a chance to prove that I meant that because the guys at NAA had already elected me to be the chair of CFC for the state of North Carolina, the Correctional Facilities Work of AA. And uh, so my retirement lasted about a nanny second. And, <laughs> and then I was right back into the throes of the thing. And, and it's, been, it's been an absolute hoot. I've, I'm uh, tremendously involved in every aspect of service at AA. If we do it in AA, I'm involved in it at a personal level. I, I tell you what I believe, and I, 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 I'll close on these two, two points. One, I know that just from the countdown, there are a lot of, of, of us in here who are long of tooth. There are, there are a number of us in here who've got some years of sobriety. I was talking to one of the delegates, and he was talking about rotating out, and I said, just got to keep in mind, rotating out doesn't mean quit. Rotating means to move to the next thing. And so it's not a backup thing. Backup is a bad mode for us. And, and so what I look at, I'm somebody who takes very seriously what our book says when it talks about after step nine, it starts to, to focus on the fact that our, our task now is not about working on us. Our task is about being of service to others, that our real purpose is to be of maximum service to God and those about us. Well, I take that seriously. And what does that mean, that I work harder with what I do? I think I have to learn to work smarter if I want to be of maximum service. There's a lot that I can do at a personal level, looking at a drunk's eyeball. That's the most noble work we ever do. But if I want to be of maximum service, I can't limit myself to just that. I've got to think beyond that. I've got to recognize that my group is an expression of myself. And if I don't have a strong group that actively carries this message to people, that does many things outside its walls, then my group is a liability and not an asset. So I will have to build a strong group. My service district, the place where we collect, is a, is a viable, powerful thing. And if I want to be a maximum service, I have to learn how to be supportive and, and active in those kinds of issues as well. In my state, in my nation, you know, I have to be I keep pointing to Valerie because she's in the office and she sees a lot of this stuff. And so if I want to be a maximum service, that's what I have to do. I have to get outside my own shadow and expand into things where I can be of service. And when I do that, tell you what, I do every day that I, a very simple exercise that I do, every morning, at, uh, I, I got a little pond that I con my wife into by with a waterfall, and I'd love to sit out there and just sort of let that water do its work. And then I, I, I ask God to do three, th to, to, to help me with three things. One, is that I reflect on being mindful of the gift I've been given. To, to realize that I have been given a gift of sobriety from an illness that devastates the world of alcoholism. Those of us who are in recovery are barely a blip on the radar screen. When you look at the world population of alcoholics, my God, man, we have barely scratched the surface. So I, I want to be mindful. I don't know why God gave it to me. That's his business. I'm grateful that it is, and I want to reflect on that, that this is not something I stumbled into. It's a gift, and a powerful gift. And if I believe that, then I want to reflect that in how I carry myself. I don't want to demonstrate this gift by walking around with my mouth sounding like an open sewer. I want to be somebody who makes Alcoholics Anonymous seem like a good idea, that makes it look like an attractive place. So I ask God to help me be a good example of the gift I've been given. That's easy enough, isn't it? And that's small enough for a man to be given a light. Second thing I ask for is, well, that is the second thing I ask for. The third thing I ask for is to make me sensitive to opportunities to be of service. And I'll tell you something, don't make that prayer unless you mean it. <laughs> because I will guarantee you this world is filled
with opportunities to be of service. This hotel is filled with opportunities to be of service. This conference is filled with opportunities to be of service. God is everywhere. But if I'm not sensitized to it, I won't even see it if it's standing in front of me. So I want to be sensitive to that. And, and, and what happens is that I have a marvelous time in life. My God, most people my age uh, are, are, are grunting and groaning. I got stuff hurting, but I don't take time to reflect on it. <laughs> I'm busy living. And I am having an absolute ball in this thing called life. And if you're not, for God's sakes, man, don't treat this thing like a spectator sport. Don't just sit back with some kind of a rumbling, grumbling kind of approach to this thing. Lay back your ears and jump in this thing and light up that life. You only got one shot at this deal. Give it all you got. Thanks. All right. Thank you.